Good morning, everyone. It's awesome. I love it. I love it. I just saw, where'd he go? Where's, where's Pastor Lamar? Did he, does he, Pastor Lamar, if you don't know this, Pastor Lamar has been here 50 plus years. And I, I didn't tell him I was going to say this, but I've learned enough. He had heart surgery a couple weeks ago. And he's right there and he's back and he's doing great. Just want to bless him. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. And then he came back from his heart surgery and he looked at me and he goes, you're doing my funeral, right? I'm like, well, not, which was like a whole nother thing. I'm like, well, not, not today. So that's good. This past March, we had a night of vision and prayer that we do um, at the same time of year every year. And during that night, I share with you and commit to you that we're not just talking about vision, not just talking about things that we want to do, but that I will give you an update halfway through the year. And if we haven't done anything, I stand before you and say we haven't done anything. But we have, and so part of that is this morning giving you an update, not just in an announcement form, but hopefully in a God-moving sort of way. We also have a lot of life change public testimony through baptism today, which is the thing that Jesus modeled for us. It's aligning ourselves with the death and resurrection of Jesus. So that's coming. So be ready for that. And if it goes long today, just remember, we have free lunch afterwards. So if you're like, I'm late for lunch. No, you're not. It's right outside. In his book, Generous Justice, the late Timothy Keller writes this. As followers of Jesus, our love for God should translate into love for our neighbors and a desire to see justice and mercy prevail. These aren't just thoughts to inspire, but as we talked about last week, this truly is the teleos, the maturity of the individual believer, but also the maturity of the community of believers that as they gather, they are about justice. They are about mercy. They are about humility. The Old Testament prophet Micah shared these words in the midst of a time of evil kings, of the oppressors coming closer and closer, and his words to the people to give them encouragement and hope was this. What does your Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. In the midst of oppression, in the midst of these times where it's easy even for us today to say, can th things get any worse? How do we rally and get inside our walls and fight to you, God says, even in the midst of other kingdoms pressing in? Be agents of justice, bringing renewal to all of God's kids, to love mercy. To embrace the way God loves you and to love others and to walk humbly. This is not something simply to believe. This is a call to the kind of life that brings heaven to earth right now. And it's meant to be done in community. This past March, I talked about the idea of a table. And if you were here, we had a literal table here. And as we know, tables in your home can be a place where you drop your stuff, right? Your packages, your Amazon, your junk. As a kid growing up, my mom would always say, would you get your junk off the table? And as a husband, time to time, my wife needs to remind me, this is not your desk. You have one upstairs. But I'm like, but I like to be in all spaces at all times. She goes, not today. <laughs> a table can be a canvas for holidays. Some of you are so artistic and you put beautiful things on your table. All of us have a table in our homes and some of them sit empty. And we remember what used to be. But today I want to say this is also what could be. The table is meant to be a space for a powerful spiritual practice. A place of justice, mercy, and humility. Emma Rooker wrote this. During his ministry, Jesus took some things as simple and habitual as a meal and made it a habit to share it with others with the hope of someday sharing a meal with them in heaven. Let me back up a bit. 
One of the great tragedies of the self-imposed Western culture that we've done in churches is that we connect ourselves to how well we're relating with God and other people within a church within the 75 minutes on a Sunday. We show up and we leave, and then we determine whether internally or some kind of weird Yelp review, this church is kind, I can grow. But the early church was not that way. Nor can you gauge a relationship on an hour spent with somebody else. The early church looked like this in Acts 2. They devoted themselves. Devoted was one of those key words. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, and everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What was their strategic way of reaching people for Jesus? They lived like Jesus lived. They didn't have these fancy things. They didn't have these sky riders. They didn't do all these things. They simply gathered together and were the presence of Jesus with each other on a consistent basis. Now I know our modern reality of our lives are not like the early church. It's not like 2,000 years ago. But there's still an absolute need for our personal daily connection with God and also our consistent communal community relationship with God. Here's the truth. In today's world, you do not lack for content, do you? At any time of the day, 24-7, you can pull out that phone and listen to whatever you want to listen to. You can access the greatest preachers on this in this world from the past x amount of decades and listen to them at any time and you can go i just wish pastor dale was like this <laughs> i will always fall short of your favorite preacher so every once in a while some of you say i'm your favorite preacher and i'm like you need to listen to more content <laughs> we do not lack for content but i can tell you this is what we do lack for we do lack Christ-centered connection. Our world does lack for community. Our world does lack for belonging. Some time ago, I began to wonder and engage about what it means to belong, and you've heard this before from me. What is it like in a world that pushes away when you disagree, when you separate because you don't have the same ideas, what does it mean to belong? Is it simply that we need to find a group of people that believe everything that we believe about everything? Because that is really impossible. Or is it a possibility that we can look beyond what we think and listen to the other? Belonging seems like it's more than just being welcomed. It seems like it's more than just knowing where to sit and who to talk to. Because belonging is something we all desire because it was placed within us when we were created to long for something. God created this longing for him, and what we do in our longing is as that time long for him. But other times we pursue all sorts of kingdoms to fulfill that longing. This desire for longing, as, Richard, as Ronald Roldeheiser observed, can be painful. It is painful to be alone, but it is perhaps even more painful to feel alone when you're not alone. The desire to belong is not just something within the church. As you know, as I've shared, the world is experiencing this as well. In an NPR article that came out in May of 2023, they said, there is an epidemic of loneliness in the United States, and lacking connection can increase the risk for premature death to levels comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, according to a new advisory from the U.S. Surgeon General. And once again, you can pursue content about this. I do not bring this up to motivate those who lack connection to wake up. I do bring this up for all of us to lift our faces up, our eyes up, and look at each other and say, what can I do for you? As I looked across at the table this week at a teary-eyed individual struggling, and he says, Pastor, 
they're not listening to what you're saying about this. The hardest place is when you're talking about loneliness and you're experiencing and other people just go along. My encouragement, we can sit in a room full of people. What causes us to flip this place on its head? What causes us not to be lured into strategies that don't mean much? But what engages with this world is if I raise up my head and look at you in the eyes and say, you matter, Mike. I know there are times it's tough, isn't it, buddy? But you matter to me. What can I do for you today? You see, we are excellent advice givers in all sorts of things. You know what you should do? You should do this. Good luck. We talked about that last week. The lines, what can I do for you and you should, both can seem wise to people. You're like, you know what? I'm the kind of person that just gives great advice. I don't remember a single commandment when Jesus goes, may you give great advice to other people. Because what we do, it's a transfer. I have some advice for you. Here's some things you should do. Um, I'm off. But to be the kind of people that say, hey, what can I do for you? This takes real training, experiences, engagement from all of us. The theologian Barry D. Jones wrote this. I'm convinced that one of the most important spiritual disciplines for us to recover in the kind of world in which we live in is the dis discipline of table fellowship. In the fast-paced, tech-saturated, tension-deficit disordered culture in which we find ourselves, Christians need to recover the art of a slow meal around a table with people we care about. We need a recovery of the spiritual significance of what we eat, where we eat, and with whom we eat. In today's culture of individual isolation and, and loneliness, we often don't know where to find the seat. We often don't know who to ask of who has a seat. And we don't know how to get invited to another's place. And so what we do is we set up walls and simply do what we always do. And the enemy goes, I got you. Do you feel the tension in this? We've created a funnel where for 75 minutes on a Sunday, we're counting that we can go all in on connection when it can never be so. So this past March, I set up before you a couple of things that I want to update you on how we're doing. The first one is this. Our physical church buildings and property. This one may feel disconnected, but I just want to give you an update. We put together a campus utilization team. We have to create spaces where people feel like they belong, that they are welcome, that they can drive down Las Gatas Boulevard and see life. We have created a team and empowered them, a team of members named Abby Schnorr, Amy McDonald, Greg Henderson, Stephen Giordano, Erfan Modir, Beth Hanniger, and Danny Bush to go on a prayerful discovery process of what our options are. You can applaud them. To where God is leading us to maximize our hospitality and our outreach to each other and to our community. A survey went out to all of our members. About 50% of our members filled out this extensive survey. It was pretty extensive. And from that, met with members and groups and listening and, and talking. This team met with members and staff and elders to hear about their, th their thoughts and their hopes. They're gathering real information from experts in our community about options and costs of projects and needs of the campus and needs of this church. They have made significant process and they're developing a bold beautiful vision for a renewed campus that I'm just telling you what we're going to present to you when we're ready is a whole different look and says this to our community versus come and try to find us. We dare you. <laughs> we're going to present some things that might challenge you. You might go, this is the way I used to like it to be. But the beautiful thing about what God has is I have something new, even for a church that's 76 years old. But just like a literal table is a vehicle for hospitality, no matter how beautiful we make spaces, we need hospitable people within those spaces. And that takes work. But that takes growth. So the second literal table that I put before you this year, and this really is to celebrate something. I challenged us to have 40 missional meals this year. 
These are meals in the, in, in the homes of people that you simply sign up for and you join and you bring food. It's kind of like a little potluck and you gather and you talk and you pray for each other. These are people that you don't know. These are meals for a training ground, a space for learning and experiencing something new. This is for those who wanted and those who, who didn't realize they needed it. The goal was 40. So from the time of April, May, June, July, I know the months of the year, the first five months, we've had 32 missional meals. Church, well done. Well done. I think we have a picture of, you can't really see, but there's a picture of a lot of the meals. Wait, some of you are in there more than once. You keep eating. No, you're welcome to be as many as you want. We have 32 so far. We have more planned. We need more hosts. But I have some quotes from people who went, and I just want you to hear in case you're like, I ain't going to that. All right. Here are some quotes. We've been at the church 20 years or so. It was pretty amazing to have a meal with someone who has also been at the church over 20 years and we've never met. As a new member, it was an amazing opportunity to get to know folks at a deeper level and listen to their story. I was really nervous to go, and I almost canceled, but I decided to be brave, and it ended up being the highlight of my month. It felt like, what a, it felt like a picture of what church is, different people that can seem to have little in common but connect at a deeper level. This might be my favorite quote. I wasn't sure about this idea, but I did it because Dale told us to. Yes! My wife and I ended up enjoying it so much, we decided to host one too. From someone in their 80s telling this to somebody in their 20s, we would have never have met you on a Sunday, but I'm so glad we got to know you. When I recognize people in church I've spent time with, it feels more like home. I just moved here and I'm looking for friends. I heard you talk about missional meals and so I signed up and now I have people I can sit with on a Sunday morning. Attending a mission new meal was a wake-up call for how I need to put my head up more at church. Since I went to one, I have met new people every week because I'm looking to connect instead of just keeping to myself. Church, this is slow cultivating a loving and Christ-like culture in our church, and let's keep moving forward. So really, really well done. I thought 40 meals was like, you're like Dale, it's just a meal. I know, but I'm telling you, to get an isolation culture engaged with each other once again will transform us. In a couple of weeks, we'll start a series, a church-wide series on transformation. This series will cover our kids, our students, our adults, arm in arm. And I think this goes hand in hand with what we're going to do. I also talked about a couple of things, and we're about to get to baptism soon. But I talked about a couple of things that are still coming up in 2024 that I just want you to know about. One, we are filming a new online course next month that examines biblical generosity and finances. This really talks about the reasons why followers of Jesus should partner together and super practical tools for your own finances. Jesus talked, the Bible talks about finances over and over and over and over again. For some of you who are like, you're, you're having this class because that pastor wants to get a hand on my pocketbook. I do not want a hand in your pocketbook. I don't even want a hand in my pocketbook. I want God to have a hand, and this is absolute truth with you. Because there's something amazing that will happen in your life. And secondly, we're having our second pastoral residency this upcoming October, October 20th to the 27th, with Dr. Rick Langer from Biola University. Dr. Langer wrote two books, Winsome Conviction, Disagreeing Without Dividing the Church, and win some persuasion, a Christian influence in a post-Christian world. Both were marked by Christianity Today of Books of the Year. The reality of this is that we don't know how to have conversations around things we disagree with. And with a presidential election coming up, it's going to magnify and raise things up to even a greater level. I said, man, there is no more important time to have some strong biblical teaching, not to just what talk about, but how do we talk to each other? How do we not lose our engagement with one another during one of those times where the enemy just wants to wreak havoc? It is easy to lose our way and drift into embracing politics over people. It is it, we drift into embracing platforms over his plan for the world. 
So we're having this conference, both Sundays, a midweek lecture to help us with biblical teaching on how we do this really well. What do you say? Should we do this well? Should we not be a place that's divided over ideologies? Ideologies are important. It's important to talk through the things, of course. But we're called to something higher about how we do it. But now I want to celebrate life change. I want to celebrate the very things of why we gather, and I want to celebrate this with 13, 4. However many people are getting baptized today, if you didn't sign up and you want to jump in, who's stopping you? We have numerous baptisms. It's going to be a little bit different than maybe what you normally experience, what you've experienced before. We're going to have one person come and share their life story or share their story, a story. Hopefully it's about Jesus, right? Okay. (laughs) Their story. We're going to have numerous people coming in and just declaring, I am a follower of Jesus, I believe. We're going to have some music playing and some choruses. So this is like a full participation thing, right? So it might feel different to some of you. Just go with us for a little bit. But I want to invite up John Allman. Where's John? I think he's... John, come on up. Why don't you welcome up John just to share with us. John, you are looking good, brother. (laughs) This is my friend John. I'm glad I picked a low-key day for this. (laughs) Yeah. I'm glad you didn't. Because I want all these people to celebrate with you. Why don't you share with us just some things about why you're being baptized today or whatever else you prepared to talk about. So uh, we, uh, we moved from New York to California about a year and a half ago. And with my life, Lizzie, we've got uh, four kids that uh, are mostly grown up, one more in college, rooting for him. <laughs> and um, we went on a mission when we got here to California to find a church. And um, we went to a lot of different places, but we found a great one. And we just felt so welcomed when we joined a couple months ago, and uh, it's, it's, uh, we just feel great about it, and we're just so happy to be here with you today. Awesome. Awesome. What's, can I just ask you this question? Mm-hmm. Why be baptized today? Like, what, is, what does Jesus mean to you, John, that, you, that you're willing, or you didn't know that all these people might be here today, <laughs> but that you're willing just to say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus today? Well, it's funny. So I, I called my mother this weekend, and I said to my mom in New York, I said, uh, uh, I'm getting baptized this week. And yeah. she said to me, you've already been baptized. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I said I thought I needed a big refresher course. Yeah. <laughs> um, my walk with Christ, I guess, uh, when I think about it, it's been kind of uh, seasonal, you know. So I've had some seasons in my life. Um, I this number, I kind of reached it this year, was 60. Mm. And I've had some seasons that I felt really good where I was connected with Christ, and then I had some real uh, spiritual droughts, mm. you know. And this part of my life, I just made a, a, a decision, and um, I'm a marketing guy, and uh, in marketing, we pay really close attention to messages and what people say and how we position things out in the world. Um, And there was this concept called uh, in the 80s, which I think everyone in this room who kind of around my age will recognize. It was this concept we called work-life balance. Hmm. Hmm. And um, really, if you really pulled it apart, what it really was slang for was uh, you know, life is this kind of rat race, and we're all out here, and we got to win, which was really a sign of commercial success. Uh, and But to really be successful, you need to keep balance of things like your work and your community. And kind of inherent in that was your church was part of that, where everything just needed to become in balance. And if you... Um, If you stayed in balance, you would have this amazing life. And I just made this decision that uh, I'm not going to be into work-life balance. I wanted to be Christ-centered. And that was, for me and for all these amazing people with me, uh, Christ-centered is what I'm trying to do. Thanks, man. I'm going to hand it over to Jacob and Tyler. 
Our first baptism um, this morning is Angela. She is a freshman at Los Gatos High School, and she also led us in worship this morning. So can you guys give her a big round of applause? Amazing. So Angela, because of the decisions that you made and your desire to be here and get baptized this morning, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. If you agree with them, just say yes afterwards, okay? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins so that you can have an intimate, personal relationship with him? Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And is it your desire to follow him all the days of your life? Well, upon the confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. with us here. You might have seen him on stage. And uh, Dean, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Sure. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again so that your sins can be forgiven and you can have an intimate relationship with Jesus? I do. Yes. And have you received Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? I have. And is it your desire to follow Jesus all the days of your life? Yes. Awesome. It's with that profession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. All right, this is Owen. Yes, Owen, I'm so excited uh, for the work that God's doing in your life. And uh, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again for your sins? Have you received Jesus as Lord and Savior? Yes. And is it your desire to follow him all the days of your life? Awesome. It's with that profession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And our last student this morning is Zane. Zane is a senior at Los Gatos. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, all right? Zane, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again so that you can have an intimate personal relationship with him? I do. Have you received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life? I have. And is it your desire to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Well, upon the profession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Through the sunset Relationship with God. 
Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Is it your desire to follow after him all the days of your life? It is upon this confession of your faith that we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. okay do you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again so that all your sins can be forgiven yes. and so you can have an intimate relationship with God yes. have you received him Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior yes is it your desire to follow after him all the days of your life okay yes. it is by the confession of your faith that we now baptize you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit To the sun set free, hope is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am. This is Sharon, mom of Sean. <laughs> Sharon, do you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again so that all your sins can be forgiven and so that you can have an intimate relationship with God? Yes. Have you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. And do you wish to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. It is upon your confession of faith that we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living died and rose again so that all of your sins could be forgiven and so that you could have an intimate relationship with God. I do. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Is it your desire to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. It is upon your confession of faith that we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> John, a couple questions. John, do you believe that Jesus died and rose again for the forgiveness of your sins and that you can have a personal, intimate relationship with him? I do. Have you prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I have. Do you commit to following him for the rest of your life? Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Through the sun sets free Hope is breathing. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. And last but not least, this is John Osborne, everybody. John, I have a couple, couple questions for you. <laughs> John, do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Yes. Do you believe that he took punishment for your sins and that you can have a personal relationship with him? Yes. Yes. John, have you prayed to receive Christ as your to follow him, following him for the rest of your life. Forever. Okay. Upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you, our brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have broken every chain. There's salvation.
Amen. Wasn't that amazing? It's beautiful. It's, um, yeah, I, I have, last week I was having a moment where I forgot to come up at the end, if you're here in that service. One of the young men, I mean, all, like, all, I don't, but one of the young men who I had to go see, he, I first met him on the football field a few years ago. And to see him now, standing there getting baptized, I just want you to believe that no matter where you are, who you are, if it, it's up to God. He's just asking you to be the presence of Jesus wherever you are and let him do the work. Let him do the things. And so I embraced him, and he was really wet. <laughs> Sometimes I don't think through my life choices. Today's like this, and I'm not going to be very long, so if you're like, wait, he's got a whole nother sermon? Just hang in there. <laughs> Days like this can cause us to look forward, to hope for something. Maybe it's in your own life. It could be in the life of a child you're praying for, or a parent that you're worried about. It could be for your community around you. But as we look forward, we all have expectations, right? And expectations for other people and other things. You have expectations for Jesus, no doubt, of what he can and will do. You have expectations for his kingdom, for church. You most likely have expectations for me. What gives me great assurance, even standing in this space, is that Jesus fully understood what expectations felt like coming at him. There was expectations of what a kingdom of God would look like and what could look like. So Jesus took on the challenge of getting people past their distorted view of what the world and what other people were about, and through parables told them that the kingdom of God was going to be like this. It's going to be different, but it's going to be better and different. <laughs> he gives this explanation. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? He's kind of like, huh, what, do, what should I say right now? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Basically he's saying, listen, if you're expecting the kingdom of God to come all at once, let me clarify this for you. It is like a slow-growing tree. I mean, it takes a long time. I have this Japanese maple behind my office. You're like, I've been behind your office. I don't see a tree. Exactly. <laughs> Every day I open my window and I'm like, well, you look like you're alive. Let's grow. But it's slow. Sometimes I go, man, the next pastor after me is really going to enjoy a tree. <laughs> a long time from now. In my backyard, in my little patio, my townhome that I have, there's these massive redwood trees that I look up at. And at times I go, man, if those fell, and then I stop thinking about that. <laughs> but so often I enjoy sitting under the shade and the beauty of this tree and have some of my most wonderful conversations with Lisa at that time. But what I do think about is that somebody had the vision for this to be the experience for somebody else one day. That if this were to be planted, just think what might happen. And that's what I want to leave you with today is a few thoughts about, can you imagine what might happen? Jesus is saying what the kingdom of God is like and that it will start small. You see, the problem with small is that sometimes we think small is just insignificant. Especially in our day and age and in our culture when we're all about the big and we're all about the important. That kind of makes the kingdom of God really hard at times. Because we feel like if it's not something big, it's not that important. And if it's not big and huge, then God must not be in it. Right? Because we want everything to be spectacular all the time. We do this because everything in our world is. Everything on our iPhone is spectacular. And if it doesn't work within moments of time, we're like, this stupid thing. Social media is like that, too. 
But life isn't like that. A lot of life may not just be amazing. It might feel normal or ordinary at times. But my friends, if you would just pause for a second, there can be a beauty in the ordinary, in and out breathing of life with each other as well. If we're willing to look at each other in the eyes, if we're willing to wipe tears from each other's faces, if we're willing to embrace the joy that we might experience individually. Here's what I have found to be true. I sat in a garden yesterday, a vegetable garden with my wife. Somebody invited us over to pick the vegetables. Just because they are on vacation doesn't mean they didn't know we were there. And I'm sitting there, there's trees and vegetables, and I picked one of the largest squashes I've ever seen. It's like the size of a child. So we have zucchini squash for the whole church today. We canceled the lunch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's something about vegetable gardens where you don't just plant seeds once or twice and go, well, these will work for the next 40 years. What do you do? You dig them up and plant new ones. Dig them up and plant new ones. Dig them up and plant new ones. For those of you that might be sitting and engaging, like I already planted some seeds, let's just go back to those vegetables. For that season, those vegetables were good and nutritional, but that plant has stopped growing fruit. God calls us to plant new seeds and new things in today's world and in today's culture and in today's church that is biblically sound and biblically true and historically right, but new. Because what if you woke up in the morning and you said, God, what new thing do you have for me? And you're like, he's like, ah, I, I overslept. We're counting on God's new mercies every day, are we or not? Don't we praise God that his mercies are new every day? And if we simply resist and go, I like yesterday's mercies better. We've out of alignment. If you're waiting for something to grow, don't give up, my friends. Plant that seed dig around it, protect it, watch over it, water it, let it grow, because this is what I have found to be true. Faithfulness always precedes fruitfulness. Faithfulness precedes fruitfulness. We need each other to help each other stay faithful. Not to make God happy, because he's already crazy about you. But to remain faithful to the things that God has called us to do for our world and for each other. And I'm telling you, you too will have a moment that three years after seeing a young man on a football field be baptized. That is out there for you too. Are you willing to plant new seeds with me? I need people to cultivate this world. I need people who are willing to engage with their neighbors. So often what happens in my own life, I get sucked into alternative kingdoms, thinking they look a little better or a little faster. But Jesus said this. Will you open up and just receive these words for a second? Do not worry. Do not say, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first. There's a huge word there. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That is so good. Seek his kingdom. Seek his righteousness, and things will be given to you. Do you hear me? Don't give up. Don't let the hurts of yesterday derail you. They are so hard. I am not lessening any of the hurts or suffering that we go through. They are real. They're authentic. And we need to mourn those things. Pause. Sometimes long pause. And God has something new. Will you sow the seeds with me? to see what God can do here 
even with the oppressing things that we feel like this world, so many bad things are happening in the midst of that. He says, church, will you act justly? Will you love mercy? Will you walk humbly with your God? Father, we thank you and praise you. Hmm. What a humble blessing it is, Father, to be called your children, to be your church. Father, I pray that we might be able to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly because you are God. I pray for those in our church this morning who are hurting, that maybe have given up hope that you, your spirit, would comfort them and the eyes of somebody else would restore them. May we be bold to minister to one another, to love one another as you have loved us. In your name, amen.